Hello, and welcome to Greg Does Physics. My name is Greg, and today we are going to be doing some physics. Today we will be doing problem 3.37 in Griffith's intro to e and m And problem 3.37 says this. In section 1.4, I proved that the electrostatic potential at any point P in a charge-free region is equal to its average value over any spherical surface, radius r, centered at p. Here's an alternative argument that does not rely on Coulomb's law, only on Laplace's equation. We might as well set the origin at p. Let v average, as a function of r, be the average. Now first show that, uh, and then it gives us this formula, which you'll see on the screen. Note that the r squared in dA cancels the 1 over r squared out front, so the only dependence on r is in v itself. Now, use the divergence theorem and conclude that if v satisfies Laplace's equation, then v average of r equals v average of 0, which equals v of p for all r. I thank Ted Jacobson for suggesting this proof. That's the footnote. Wow. Okay. A um, lot of words, uh, but it's actually not as hard as you might think. And so... Our first step is that he wants us to find the derivative of our average potential over some sphere. Like he said, we've placed this sphere uh, to have its center, the point P, at the origin, and it's a sphere of some radius capital R. And he wants us to show that the uh, calculation for the average potential over the surface of the sphere, differentiated with respect to R, is given by that formula. So to do that, if we need to find the derivative of this average potential with respect to r, our first step should then be to find the average potential so that we can differentiate it. So let's think about that. So our v average over this sphere, um, how do you do this? You can think about taking the average potential at each quote-unquote point on this spherical shell and then adding them all up and then dividing by the surface area is basically what what we're doing here and so one way to write that is the closed loop integral da over the closed loop integral of whatever surface you're integrating over and so this bottom integral here is the would be equal to the surface area of the sphere the, that is the surface that we're, the area that we're integrating over. And so we can rewrite this since the surface area of the sphere is going to be 1 pi, or excuse me, just pi r squared. Um, we can rewrite that as this. But in spherical coordinates, or when we're, at least when we're integrating over the surface of a sphere, our dA it looks like this. It's r squared sine theta d theta d phi. And so what we could do is that we could then write this as 1 over 4 pi r squared closed loop integral v r squared sine theta d theta d phi. But since we're uh, integrating over the surface of the sphere, our radius r is held constant, and so we could take this capital R out of the integral, and then it would cancel with that one. So, then we have 1 over 4 pi, closed loop integral v sine theta d theta d phi. And so this is what Griffiths mentioned in the problem, that the r squared dependence of dA cancels with this r squared out here, and so then the only r dependence in this term is going to be in V. And so then when we differentiate V average with respect to r, we can move this derivative into the integrand And this is what it looks like, since again, V is the only thing that has a capital R dependence. None of these other terms do. 
But what is dV dr? Now, one way we could think about this is that this is, if you were to write the gradient of a vector of our, uh, not vector, the gradient of our scalar v, the potential, then uh, if we were to look at the component of this, in the r hat direction, that would just be our dv dr. So the component of the gradient is pointing radially outward. And so then we could rewrite this 1 over 4 pi. Um, and then also, now that we've done our differentiation, uh, without consequence, we could multiply this by r squared over r squared, since that's just 1. And so we'll have that r squared out here, closed loop integral here, um, gradient of v dotted, and then uh, since these are all, uh, and, and so we could move these terms around, r squared sine theta d theta d phi, and of course our element of area points radially outward as well, which is um, in the same direction as uh, as uh, this term was. And so when we write this like this, and we moved our terms around, we can see that this is just our element of area. And so then we can finally write this as d average dr equals 1 over 4 pi r squared, closed loop integral, gradient of v dotted with a. Um, now, I, I explained this step to this step as just um, re-expressing our dvdr as this dot product of the gradient of e with that r hat direction, and then moving these terms around such that we can see that this equality is just dA. But we could also think of it in a different way, in that uh, if we're saying that this expression is true, that our dvdr is just the component of the gradient of e in the r hat direction, and once we put the r squared over r squared back in, then we'll say that this is just the magnitude of dA, but dA, of course, is just in the r hat direction, and so we don't necessarily have to shuffle these things around. We could just uh, make that observation and then go straight to saying that, well, if these are both the r hat components of dA and the gradient of E, then we could just write that to be the dot product of them. Um, so yeah, and then knowing that dA is entirely in the, in the r hat direction, so um, there's nothing lost. Um, anyway, so there's that. So then it says that, um, now use divergence theorem and conclude that v satisfies that if v satisfies Laplace's equation, then v average of r has to equal v of p. And so if you remember, uh, divergence theorem or Green's theorem, whatever you want to call it, looks like this. It says that the uh, integral of the divergence of some vector, we'll call it A, integrated over some volume is equal to the closed loop integral of that vector dot dA um, over the surface of, of what encloses that volume that we're integrating over. And uh, let me just double check that equation. Yeah, looks good. So uh, clearly, um, 
this uh, integral right here, we could model it to look like that. We would just say that our vector a in this case is the gradient of v. So then by divergence theorem, we can say that this equals 4 pi r squared volume integral of the divergence of the gradient of v, d tau. However, what is the divergence of a gradient? Well, that is just the Laplacian. And so this is equal to 1 over 4 pi squared volume integral Laplacian v d tau. But if we are looking at this in the case of, um, but we want this to be in the case where Laplace's equation is true. And Laplace's equation says that our Laplacian of v is equal to zero, at least in the region that we're looking at. And so if this is equal to zero, then this is zero, and then this whole thing has to be zero. So then what we're saying is that the uh, average potential, that is, the um, if you were to take the average of all the potentials over the surface of the sphere, um, no matter what, you can change this radius um, without consequence. That average potential over the surface of the sphere will always be the same. That's what it means in the case that this dv average dr equals zero. And so if that's the case, then say at a given r, we have, we calculate some v average. Now that means that we could change this r and our v average would still be the same. So let's say we take our sphere at some given radius r and we shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it all the way down until that radius r approaches zero. It would still be the same as before. But if our radius is zero, and we're looking at the average potential over some sphere of radius zero, that's basically the same thing as the radius at that, uh, as the uh, potential at that point. And so our V average with a radius of a sphere of zero, we can just re-express as the potential at the origin or the potential at point P. And so then QED, We've shown that in the case where Laplace's equation holds up, that for a given sphere of radius r, if we were to compute the average potential over the surface of the sphere, that is going to be the same as the potential at the center of that sphere, what we've defined at point P. And that's just based on us showing that you can change the radius of this sphere, and as long as Laplace's equation holds up, that average potential over the surface of that sphere will not change regardless of whether we increase or decrease capital R. And so uh, I like this. Um, it's not, the math itself isn't extremely complicated, but I like it because it shows us another way of thinking about the characteristics of solutions to Laplace's equation. Because Griffiths tells us that in the three-dimensional case, solutions to Laplace's equation um, have this special characteristic in that you can take a sphere uh, surrounding a point P and compute the average potential over the surface of the sphere and it'll be the same as the uh, potential at the center of that sphere. And the way he, he shows that is he starts with a case where, much like this, except he says, okay, imagine there's a point charge Q out there and then what he does is, this, uh, with this configuration, he directly computes the potential at uh, the center of the sphere, and then he also computes the potential over the surface of the sphere, and then just shows that the average of the potential of the surface of the sphere is the same at that center. And then says, uses the argument of the principle of superposition to say, well, we could then create any charge distribution we want with however many um, point charges and it'll add up and 
will always have this characteristic hold up. Um, however, that proof only really uses superposi superposition and Coulomb's law. But I think that this one is a little bit more illustrative of how this claim of this characteristic of solutions to Laplace's equation, it directly uses Laplace's equation to show you one of those results rather than sort of skirting around ever using directly Laplace's equation. Um, so for that reason, you know, I, there are two different proofs. They show us the same thing. Um, and for that reason, you know, they're both good ways of, of showing us how this characteristic holds up for Laplace's equation. And it's an important thing to keep track of uh, as you go forward. And uh, I think that will be all for this video. So thank you for watching.